thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Um, so first of all, I want to say I think it's very exciting that uh, CVPR is running this experiment in highlighting uh, these challenges. I think you know, Kaggle looks over uh, machine learning challenges across the board, and I think there is no community uh, that, that machine learning challenges have had a bigger impact on than computer vision. Um, so with this uh, introduction uh, to, to the four competitions, uh, I was going to talk a, a little bit about some of the attributes uh, of competitions, uh, some of their limitations, uh, and then you know, what we see as the future of machine learning uh, challenges. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, we'll open up with the, the power of challenges. Why are they a, a, an impactful way to do research? Um, so, or, or to, to progress the state of the art. Um, so first of all, I think one of the areas where competitions are really powerful is they, they show what's possible. Um, they give a very clear sense, given the state of the art in machine learning, you know, what can be achieved. So certainly uh, almost all the challenges we run, and I think that most challenges, uh, uh, that are run uh, show a live leaderboard. And so people, as they're competing, can see how they're performing relative to others. Um, and this has this uh, really interesting effect. And, and to explain the effect, um, well, the effect is sort of obvious, right? You can see how you're performing relative uh, to others, which ends, ends up being quite motivating. Um, I'm going to illustrate this with one of our very early challenges. Now, this um, was a computer vision challenge that we did in conjunct that Kaggle did in conjunction with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, and the idea here was to measure very precisely the ellipticity of galaxy, uh, galaxies um, from, uh, from images taken from telescopes. Uh, and the reason that NASA cared about this is galaxies have a natural elliptical shape. If you can measure the ellipticity of a galaxy very precisely, um, you can figure out whether it's being stretched. And if it's being stretched, you're detecting an effect called gravitational lensing. Um, and if you're detecting that effect, you can sort of map out or interpolate the dark matter distribution of the universe. So this is a, a problem that NASA cared about a lot. Um, they'd been working on the problem for quite some time. Uh, this glaciologist uh, called Martin O'Leary from Cambridge University made a, a, a strong first entry. Now, Martin was, used computer vision in, in his everyday glaciology research. He used to take satellite images and detect algorithmically where the edges of glaciers were. Uh, and it turned out that his his solution on this problem was a really nice fit, um, such that he was actually able to outperform in less than a week the best that NASA had done in a decade. And there's this really nice post that went up. Uh, that the, this was on the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy blog. They wrote that the world's brightest physicists have been working on this problem for a, uh, a decade. And in less than a week, Martin O'Leary uh, was able to outperform. Um, in this post, they talk about, if you re read the fine print, they talk about uh, this idea of gravitational lensing and how it comes from Newton's law of gravity and Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, so Martin, who has both a Twitter account and a sense of humor, uh, gets on Twitter and he says, uh, not that I'm bragging or nothing, but the White House has just compared me to Einstein and Newton. So he was, yeah, he was very happy with himself. Um, but he doesn't stay happy for very long, because what happens next? Somebody passes him, then he passes them, they pass him, he passes them. And eventually, you'll see that the, sorry, that should have explained the y-axis is error, the lower the better, the x-axis is time. Um, eventually, you'll see that the scores flatten out. The way to interpret this is that given the state of the art in machine learning um, and the, the amount of signal in the data set, there's a limit to what you can get out of the data set. And this kind of competitive dynamic is a very, very powerful way uh, to, to, again, given the state of the art in machine learning and the, and the signal in the data set, is to figure out, um, you know, what is possible on a particular use case, uh, given the state of the art in machine learning. Um, the second one is you can trust the results from a well-run challenge. So um, what I mean by this is, uh, well, well, I should explain. So I, I, sh I mentioned that Kaggle, uh, and, and I think a lot of the others who run challenges as well, use a format where you have a live leaderboard that shows the results in real time, but then at the end of the competition, that test data set is thrown away, and the, the results are retested on a second test data set. Um, now, in, a, in our case, um, people can put in up to five entries per day, but at the end of the competition, they can only select two of all of their entries that get scored on the, the, that never seen uh, test data set. Um, and so what that means is that, um, th that people are forced to build an algorithm that generalizes, not one that overfits to either the training set or the, the leaderboard set. Um, Interestingly, when we see uh, people compete on Kaggle for the first time, 
we often see that when they're, you know, they're competing in the competition, they're optimizing for the public leaderboard, uh, the competition's coming to an end, and, and this, this is a case of Gregory Park, uh, who was a, a new member of our community at the time. Um, he was very excited, his first competition is coming in the top 10, uh, he stays up till midnight when, we're, when we flip over the leaderboards, um, keeps hitting refresh, refresh, refresh. He's not in the top 10 anymore. He's not even in the top 20, not even in the top 30. What had happened was he had overfit to the uh, public leaderboard uh, and then when, when we rescored him on the other test data set, his, his position had dropped dramatically. He had overfit. Um, and it's amazing how many first-time Kagglers overfit. And these are people with, you know, good research profiles. Uh, these are people who uh, have, uh, well, well, you know, work at well-regarded companies in industry. And it just makes me wonder how many of the world's research papers have overfit results. Uh, how many of the world's algorithms running in, the, in production are actually, you know, somewhat overfit. Um, and, and so one very nice thing about challenges is if they're well set up, you can trust the results. You know they're not overfit. Um, the third one, uh, the third advantage of challenges is they're a, a very, very efficient way to propagate new breakthroughs. Um, actually, in preparing for this talk, I went back and looked at Kaggle's first serious competition. Uh, we were running, taking genetic markers and trying to predict the progression of HIV viral load. Um, and it was interesting, there was this f fascinating forum thread where people were discussing the kinds of techniques uh, they were using. There were things like self-organizing maps, kernel strings, you know, logistic regression. Um, there were lots of, lo lots of techniques you don't really hear much about anymore. Um, it became very clear within, say, our first six months at, at Kaggle that there was one technique that was um, uh, dominating competitions, and that was, in, this is, remember, 2010. That was the combination of hand-rolled features and random forest. So this chart shows the mentions of uh, three different algorithms, uh, logistic regression, neural networks, and random forest. Uh, in the Kaggle forums. You can see Random Forest is barely mentioned uh, in 2010. Uh, in 2011, it's, it's jumped ahead of both logistic regression um, and, uh, and then continues to grow uh, in 2012. Uh, there's a reason I had to cut this chart off at 2012. Something big happened in 2012 that changed, uh, changed the story of that chart. Uh, you can probably guess what that is. So um, uh, another great example of competitions propagating results and making it very clear what are the dominant techniques um, is obviously the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge, uh, pro probably the most impactful machine learning challenge that's ever been run. I think it's not hard to argue. Um, if you look in 2011, 2010 and 2011, um, you know, there wasn't much difference between the winning scores, you know, around about 25% error. Uh, on, the, uh, on the problem. Um, you got, jump forward to 2012, and obviously there was the big uh, convolutional, or the big neural network breakthrough, um, and for the first time, uh, that 25% mark was broken. You look to 2013, and almost every team uh, uh, out, did better than 25% error. Um, and so this is a really nice chart that shows how, and then you see as architectures get better and better, you see uh, techniques start to propagate. Um, now, Here's a thought experiment. What, happened, what would have happened if that 2012 um, you know, neural network result was just published in a paper and there was no accompanying challenge? You know, my guess is that probably what would have happened is it would have been cited by a few researchers and then a few more researchers would have cited that paper and it would have eventually propagated out. The, you know, the cream rises to the top. Uh, but I don't think that the, you know, the, the deep, deep learning convolutional neural network revolution would have happened nearly as quickly if not for a challenge uh, to propagate uh, that breakthrough so quickly. Um, and then finally, um, challenges draw focus on a, on a particular area. Um, you know, just as an example, I think in 2015, uh, Coco ran an image captioning challenge, and not long after, we started seeing many, many, it drew a lot of focus uh, on, on image captioning, uh, and we started to see a lot of in interesting breakthroughs coming through subsequent to that. Um, in, uh, in the Kaggle setting in 2013, we ran a competition uh, on um, taking images of the eye and trying to di diagnose an eye disease called diabetic retinopathy. Um, this is an eye disease that typically impacts uh, lower income people um, and it's, um, it's, it's very preventable if you can identify it earlier. So if you, you get somebody, you diagnose somebody when they have a rating one or two diabetic retinopathy, you can prevent it. If you wait till they're rating three or four, their vision is impaired or, or ultimately they end, you know, can end up going blind. Um, and, and, you know, who in the computer vision world uh, would know to 
to target diabetic retinopathy, uh, a challenge draws focus. Um, the results from this competition were spectacular. So um, the, the, uh, the, the training set and the test set had uh, two labelers, so you had two ophthalmologists providing a diagnosis. Uh, and the, the discrepancy between the winning algorithm uh, and, and sorry, the two, the two ophthalmologists was about the same as the discrepancy between uh, the winning algorithm and either ophthalmologist. Um, and so this showed the California Healthcare Foundation that this is, that machine learning is useful in this problem and, and a really good way to make uh, uh, this sort of diagnosis available to a much wider range of um, uh, uh, lower income uh, sufferers of this disease. So ho hopefully, uh, at this point, you're feeling sort of energized about competitions, and, and, and you can see at least you know, wh why some of us get very excited about them. I, I guess this is the part of the talk where um, I become what in Australia we'd call a wet blanket, or I think in the US they talk about a Debbie Downer, but we talk a bit about some of the limitations, because they do have limitations. They're not, they're not uh, suitable in all cases. Um, one of the biggest limitations is that um, poor design causes participants to optimize for the wrong thing. Uh, one of my co-workers calls uh, challenges or competitions a very powerful laser. You point them at something, and, and uh, those participating in the competition will optimize like crazy for that thing. But if you point at the wrong thing, um, uh, then you end up with results that are not, not useful, and uh, participants end up wasting a lot of time. So there's a whole lot of uh, uh, ways that competition design can go wrong. Um, one is you ask the wrong question, fairly straightforward, or you know, even subtly the wrong question. Um, choose the wrong evaluation metric, like people will optimize very heavily, participants optimize very heavily for the evaluation metric. Um, perhaps the most pernicious of all is a problem that we call leakage. Um, this is where somehow encoded in the training set uh, is the answer, uh, is the label. Um, this is something you may not have to worry about so much if, if you're working on a, you know, on a project or a data set, you're not trying to attack your own problem. Uh, but participants in a competition are trying to attack, uh, you know, if there's a way to win, uh, and there's a, there's a clever trick you can use. Um, one, one, very, one example to illustrate the leak concept that I like to give is very early in Kaggle's life, we were running a challenge to predict prostate cancer uh, based on you know, survey variables and genetic markers and so forth. And we pre-modeled the data set before it went up just to make sure it looked okay. And we're getting amazingly accurate results. And sort of, we're getting quite excited. You know, we don't need to write this as a challenge. We, we can go and uh, collect our Nobel Prize. We, we've solved prostate cancer. Um, the only problem was when we looked at the variable importance plot, um, the most uh, predictive uh, variable or feature was had prostate cancer surgery, which turns out to be a good predictor of whether somebody has <laughs> prostate cancer, thankfully. Um, um, so obviously that's not a meaningful relationship, um, and, but there's lots of subtle ways that leakage gets in in a computer vision context, like the file name. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many times the label is embedded, encoded somehow in the file name. Um, if it's tabular data, the first thing people on Kaggle, seasoned Kagglers do is they, they try and regress row number on the target variable. Um, so there's lots of ways that, um, that leakage can creep in. Another li limitation of competitions is it doesn't allow iteration on the question being asked. So um, sometimes you ask a question, you get a preliminary answer, and it causes you want to ask a variant on that question. Uh, iteration time on, with competitions is somewhat slow because you, um, you put out a challenge, and then three months later, the answer comes back. And if you want to ask a subtle variant of that challenge, the cycle times are, are, are quite slow. So very good when, the, when the, you're very sure that you're asking the right question. Um, Le less of a fit uh, in more of an open exploration setting. Um, so, uh, participants often, uh, depending on how the con competition is set up, spend a lot of time for minimal gains. Remember I, I shared this uh, NASA use case earlier. Look at how much time was spent optimizing over something that is really not meaningful. Uh, um, now, all of the interesting science, the interesting results for, the, for NASA happened within the first week. Now this, I will admit, is an extreme example. Most competitions uh, do converge, but they don't converge this quickly. But in this particular case, a lot of time was spent in order to win the competition, optimizing for something that was not uh, necessarily predicting, particularly interesting. Um, winning models are often heavy ensembles. So um, you can see, uh, to, to get from you know, maybe one, a single model gets you 99% of the accuracy, uh, but, you know, related to the slide I just showed a minute ago, or a second ago, the previous slide, um, 
to get that extra li little bit of predictive power, often uh, a lot of complexity is added uh, to the, the winning solution by adding uh, more ensembles. Um, and then finally, challenges are not a fit for every problem. Um, uh, you know, particularly, it can be hard, not impossible, but hard to set up problems uh, uh, for uh, no, unsupervised problems, for instance, in a very easy with supervised uh, machine learning, can be more challenging uh, with unsupervised machine learning. So, um, I've, I've highlighted some of the limitations. Uh, Kaggle and others are working hard on uh, diminishing those limitations and making competitions even, you know, they've had a huge impact, even more impactful. And so I wanted to end off with just a quick overview of, uh, you know, some of the things that you can see coming. Um, so you can see Kaggle, but also uh, OpenAI, Jim, uh, DeepMind Lab are putting a lot of emphasis on challenges or benchmarks that involve executing code, not just scoring results files. Um, so this is a, the screenshot I'm showing now is an our cloud-based editing environment called Kaggle Kernels. Uh, this allows you to, you know, you code in Kaggle in Python or R, um, and uh, you can add a GPU, you can have a GPU or a CPU, and, and uh, lots of customizations possible. Uh, and you hit run, and the, the code runs on servers uh, on our machines, uh, it, well, on Google's machines uh, in Google Cloud. And so this is a very powerful uh, new way to start running competitions. It has lots and lots of advantages. Um, the first one is um, it allows us to run competitions with constrained compute. So I mentioned that there's a temptation to layer on heavy ensembles. Um, we've run some challenges where people upload code, not results files, and the, the models end up being way much, much more elegant. Um, it also allows, this is one of our customers, uh, their device, uh, mobile ODT, uh, they, they take uh, images of the cervix and, and predict uh, or diagnose cervical cancer. Um, they want something that runs on a, on, a, on a mobile device. So a lot of the more interesting areas uh, of machine learning and computer vision now, or a lot, sorry, a lot of the interesting areas involve constrained compute, as we, we are able to simulate that environment. Um, second is, I, I said that competitions uh, or challenges, certainly with the static training test uh, setup, are not a fit for all sorts of, for a wide range of problems. Uh, but with the coding environments, uh, you can run challenges on a much wider range of problems. Um, one that we did in co connection with the NIPS uh, conference, I hope it's okay to mention NIPS here. Um, one uh, one uh, challenge, set of challenges we ran in connection with NIPS, um, this was with Ian Goodfellow and uh, Alex Kurikin, was um, we had a challenge that involved an adversarial attack and then another challenge that involved uh, defense against that attack. So, you know, these are the kinds of creative things, you know, agent versus agent, reinforcement learning, lots of, lots of interesting things you can start to do when, um, when participants are uploading code rather than results. Um, and I think this is a topic that is getting a lot of attention in science at the moment, but the importance of uh, reproducible research. Um, this is a huge emphasis for us. Um, if you run your code in Kaggle kernels, you can hit a make public button at the end of a challenge. Uh, and then once the code is made public, others can come, they can hit, in this case, the we have a, a notebook interface as well as a general coding interface. You can hit fork notebook and you can start playing with the winner's results, right? And so we talked about early on uh, the pro how, how challenges are interesting because they propagate uh, results quickly. Well, how much faster are they going to propagate if the winner's results are easily reproducible uh, and very easy to, uh, to play with? And so, um, you know, it's one, one of the main motivations in us putting a lot of emphasis on Kaggle kernels is trying to support uh, more reproducible research. Um, so with that, I, I hope you're all excited about challenges and I, I look forward to uh, uh, the presentations that are coming up now where I think uh, very interesting breakthroughs are going to be propagated. Thank you very much.